I have the pleasure of introducing Dr. Fajin. Actually, we organized a meeting like this uh, in Delft six years ago, and uh, we had the same problem, that there were not enough seats. So I see that uh, there's a lot of interest and uh, people sitting on the ground. Please make yourself uh, comfortable. Um, I'd like to uh, start saying a few words uh, with, uh, uh, about uh, um, Federico Fajin. Federico Vagin, as you know, uh, was born in, uh, in 1941 in Vicenza. I was very proud of being a Vicentino, uh, as far as I know. Uh, and he got a summa cum laude laurea in physics. Well, that's another thing that we discussed, physics, uh, not engineering. Um, from the University of Padua in uh, 1965. And then uh, he, uh, in 1968, the first major contribution, and that was the self-aligned gate MOS technology, a Fairchild uh, semiconductor that actually opened the doors to uh, very uh, dense uh, integrated circuits. So you're going to hear a few words about this later. And finally, the big thing, in 1971, seven, 1970 to 74, we had a slew of uh, uh, microprocessors. So the world's first microprocessor, 4004, the 8008, and the 4040, and the 8080 uh, it, at Intel. Uh, then Federico decided to leave Intel in 1974, started a company uh, that uh, is called the Zilog uh, uh, Incorporated, and this company actually uh, launched the famous Z80. So I remember this, uh, this uh, uh, microprocessor in when I was a bit more than a child because it became uh, really the basis for, for a number of uh, uh, different things that everybody used. But the amazing thing about uh, Z80 is that it is still in production. So it's still, still there. So it's incredibly long-lived uh, uh, microprocessor. Finally, it started uh, and led the Synop Synaptics uh, uh, Incorporated uh, uh, starting in uh, 1986. So this, I believe, is uh, a publicly traded company now. Very successful company, and actually the, uh, one of these companies is more, mostly uh, influential in the touchscreen industry. And actually, he told me today that the company is uh, shipping uh, several tens of millions of devices per month not per year, per month. Uh, so this, uh, this is amazing how uh, Federico could continue uh, actually with this innovation. Uh, finally, the last, uh, I think, uh, uh, company that you led was Fovion. And so I, I remember this very personally because I was involved in imaging uh, industry at the time in Silicon Valley. So I, I remember uh, he led it uh, to, the, to the sale of uh, uh, to Sigma in uh, 2008. Uh -huh. Okay, I could mention all the awards he got, uh, the Marconi Prize, the Kyoto Prize, the 2009 National Medal of Technology, uh, directly from, from the hands of uh, Barack Obama. And, uh, but the most important, I think, is the latest that you got, uh, that is the induction in the, as a National Inventor of Law of Fame in Washington, D.C. That happened in 1996. So I think this is, uh, this is very interesting. Uh, uh, of course, uh, uh, Federico is also very well known uh, uh, as a scientist and as, a, as an engineer, but perhaps less known is the work that is done very, very recently with uh, the Federico and Elvia Fagin Foundation, which is a non-profit organization that was started in 2011, uh, which uh, funded uh, scientific studies of, of consciousness. So I think for those of you that come from the Brain and Mind Institute, for those of you that are interested in this kind of topic, I think he's going to say a few words, maybe a couple of slides on, the, on this work. And finally, the last thing is the, uh, that he helped uh, uh, establishing the one million endowment for a chair of, uh, in the physics of information at UC uh, Santa Cruz in 2015. So I think there's a lot of, uh, uh, lot of contributions, and, and uh, I think probably we could go on and on, but I'd like to stop here. And I'd like to give the word directly to, uh, uh, to Federico and talk, go ahead and uh, give the presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for coming. So numerous. It's a privilege to be here. I was here in 1992 or 93 uh, for the first time. So this is my second time to your university. 
Uh, I will talk about my life, mostly what I learned, uh, the key milestones, and I will spend a fair amount of time actually at the end to talk about what I'm passionate about right now. I'm, I'm still passionate at 75, which is good, and uh, uh, which is really the nature of consciousness. And uh, I will go quickly through my life, and uh, I want to spend more time on the last part, and then hopefully there will be many questions so that I have time to answer them. So I was born in 1941, and uh, this was my hometown in 1945, after World War II ended. Uh, not a pretty sight for a four-year-old, but uh, that's what it was. I grew up and I became interested when I was 11 on model planes. Actually, that was one of the pivotal things for me, even if it looks like a toy, and it is a toy. Because when I was 11, I saw for the first time a model plane fly. And uh, I, I didn't think that you could build a toy that flies. I thought that only the big planes fly. So that was, for me was a revelation. So if it is a toy, I can build it too. So I started, I, I bought a book and I learned how to, to build a plane and I, didn't, I couldn't buy kits because they were too expensive. I was even doing my own glue by stealing broken you know, dolls from my, my sister and, and her friends uh, because I would, you know, I would use the, the celluloid with, that, uh, with uh, acetone and make, <laughs> make the glue for making model planes. But at any rate, that was uh, a contest plane that I built, designed and built when I was uh, f 14. And uh, uh, what I learned doing that was the idea of making a product. So by, actually by 12, I, I, I had very clearly the experience of what it makes to design a product. You imagine it. Then you draw it, you draw plans, you buy material, you build it, you test it, and you enjoy it. So for me, that was a wonderful, wonderful learning. Because of that, I decided to go to a technical high school. And when I uh, got out of the technical high school, by the way, the one, uh, this is me. Those are four technicians working for me. And I co-designed and built the computer that you see back here, transistorized computer in 1961. It worked. I was 19 years old. And uh, that opened up to me this whole domain of computers, which I had been interested for two years. And I had been reading everything that I could find in French or English, because there was very little in Italian, uh, about computers. So I decided to go back to, sc to school. I went to University of Padua. I graduated in 65, and then was a, 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 I taught the, the uh, 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 laboratory, electronics laboratory for stu physics students of third year, for a year. And, but then the university was too slow for me. So my next job was to go to SGS Virtual. I worked in the R&D laboratory near Milan, Agrate Brianza. And there I learned how to uh, design, you know, build and design MOS transistors. In those days, MOS devices were the Cinderella of electronics. Practically 98% of all integrated circuits in 67 used uh, bipolar technology. You, some of you probably don't even remember bipolar technology, but that was a different way to construct a transistor than MOS devices. And I had an a sort of an introduction to MOS transistors. Uh, in 66, I visited Silicon Valley uh, in a circumstances that, I, you know, it, it takes too, time, too much time to explain, but I took a course of one week at GME. GME in 1966 was a year old and was the first US company that made commercial integrated circuit using MOS devices. They couldn't make it. So the, com the company actually was bought out and failed. But I thought that MOS devices were the future. And everybody told me that I was crazy because they were so slow and so unreliable that you got to be crazy. Well, SGS Virtual got me to Silicon Valley in 1968, very early 68. I was supposed to stay six months working in the laboratory. 
of Fairchild Semiconductor, which uh, was, as you, the, the, those of you that have studied a little bit of the history of Semiconductor, Fairchild was the company that single-handedly created microelectronics. And the fundamental process that was developed was the planner process, which was invented actually by Swiss. Jean Ernie, you may have heard his name, he invented the planner process at Fairchild. He was one of the eight founders, co-founders of Fairchild. He has not been acknowledged so much for what he did, but he really put the fundamental technology, which was making many transistors at once so that they could be connected together to make anything of the circuit. That was done in 1959. Fairchild Semiconductor started in 57. And when I joined in 68, Fairchild was, a, was the most successful semiconductor company in the world. By the way, in those days, the market, total market for semiconductors was $2 billion a year. Now it's over $300 billion a year. So a Fairchild Semiconductor, I developed the first MOS self-aligned gate process technology called silicon gate. It was presented in 1968 at the International Electron Devices meeting. I also designed the first circuit to use uh, the self-aligned gate technology. This was the Fairchild 3708. It, had, it was a analog multiplexer. Those are eight large devices. They had to have very low on resistance. Uh, it had decoding logic here. And uh, this device went into production at the end of 68. And uh, uh, it was so much better than conventional technology. It was five times faster. It could have been made much denser than, than what I did. But the, uh, I, here I had to keep the same pad configuration of the metal gate version of the same device. And the 3708 uh, had about between 100 and 1,000 times less leakage than the uh, conventional MOS device. And it, it was reliable. So for the first time, we had a technology that could compete with bipolar. That was the first in the world. In fact, uh, the, we, in 69, there was a cover story on electronics announcing the uh, 3708. And by sort of early, mid-69, here I am, the American dream, my first house here. We had married, I had married my wife, Alvia. You see, she's also from Vicenza, just a few months before coming uh, in the States. And of course, we had a huge Impala. You know, man, <laughs> I was, I had made it. <laughs> but what happened was that Fertile was very, very late, very kind of uh, not moving fast in adopting the silicon gate technology, not fast enough for my taste. Uh, basically, uh, you know, the, is, it was a larger company and uh, they, they had all kinds of reasons why silicon gate was not as good as metal gate. And, and, but there was another company that started in the middle of uh, 1968 called Intel, little company Intel, two founders, Bob Noyce, was the CEO and and, the, and, and uh, Gordon Moore, and uh, uh, they started Intel, and they took the technology, the silicon gate technology that I developed at Fairchild, and that's how the company got going. So Intel was a company that started to make memories. In those days, m most computer memories were made using, uh, as you know. Uh, magnetic core, which were, you know, expensive, bulky, uh, not too fast. And uh, the, te the MOS technology had become good enough to begin to replace <coughs> those memories with random access memories made with MOS devices. First using you know, flip-flops as a bit, and then using you know, dynamic memory using three, three transistors, then eventually going back to one transistor, going down to one transistor and one capacitor, which is the same technology that is used today for dynamic RAM. Intel was developing these memories, but 
things were not going fast enough, so they wanted to also do some custom circuits. And there was a company in Japan that was in interested in getting Intel, because Intel had the best technology around days, to develop some custom chips. These custom chips were seven chips. They were intended to be used in a family of calculators, and they were designed by Bizicom. This design, however, was using serial memory, because in those days, serial memory, shift registers, was the only way to build small, me to build small memories. Serial memories, uh, shift registers were using you know, terminals, for example, you know, computer terminals, as well as in uh, calculators. And uh, so they went uh, to Intel. Uh, Intel took a look. Uh, Ted Off, who was the application research guy, uh, uh, manager took a, took a look at the at their design, Bizicom design, and he realized that if it was to use a, a dynamic random access memory, you could make a much simpler computer, a more general purpose computer, because you don't need to have to worry about where to keep track of where the data is in memory. When you have a shift register memory, you need to keep track of it, so you need a lot more logic to do it properly. And so he proposed a simplified architecture that consisted in a CPU, also a RAM, a ROM, and an I.O. chip. That family was later called the 4000 family, but neither of nor Meso that helped him, nor Shima that was the uh, engineer working for Bizicom, understood how to design. And, the, and, and, and in fact, the, the technology in those days was not sufficient to actually design the 4004 properly. It required two more inventions that I'm going to show here. The two inventions that were needed were the Burry contact. In other words, a, an invention that I had made at Fairchild where you, you make a direct connection between the polysilicon and the junction without, in, you know, by simply removing the oxide in the overlap area. And that way, with a single masking layer, you could have two layers of interconnection, and therefore making much denser random logic circuits, twice as dense. The other thing was the bootstrap load that people thought could not be made, because when you have a, the silicon gate, the self-aligning gate, you cannot have a junction underneath. So they said, you cannot make capacitors that way. I figure out a way to do it. To actually, to build, not to make a capacitor, but to make the bootstrap load. And that, with those two inventions, we could do the 4004, which is the single chip microprocessor in a single chip. And that's the result. The result is the Intel 4004. You see it here. Uh, you know, th this, this, this is the, the, those are the registers, this is the uh, stack pointer, the, uh, you know, the, the arithmetic and logic unit. It was a very powerful device, even if it was you know, packaged in a 16-pin package, which was absolutely ridiculous when I found that, that that's what they wanted to do. I said, you must be crazy. You're throwing away all the performance by f multiplexing into four lines, an address and data. You know, what are you thinking? But uh, you know, that's what they had agreed to do, and so I had to do it, and they were already six months late. So anyway, so uh, long story short, uh, uh, we lost about uh, two and a half times the performance that was possible by the technology by this silly decision. There was management decision because everything in Intel in those early days had to be 16 pins. That was religious. <laughs> and I'm not religious. Uh, on the other hand, if you go and look at the history of, uh, of uh, the, the old field, you find that there was a precursor to this idea of Bizicom. And the precursor actually goes back to the first programmable desktop calculator. There was the Programma 101. Some of you may have used it. It was introduced in 1965. It was a computer, desktop computer. It had uh, magnetostrictive memory for data. It was, it was uh, you know, cumbersome, but it was cost effective for that purpose. Magnetic card reader, printer. And essentially, it showed the world that, that you could have a real computer programmable device in a desk. And that was what got Bizicom, a few years later, to decide to have 
a CPU as a general as a general building block to make a family of calculators so that you could have different programmabilities and so on. And that was gave the, was the application that drove the microprocessor. So I, I, I explained this one, and uh, what I want to show here is that uh, when I finished the layout, it, it looked to me like an abstract painting. So I said, you know, if you, have a, if you made a painting, uh, you had to sign the painting. So I was actually, I believe I was the first engineer that put his initial, his initial <laughs> into the work of art. And it's a kind of an interesting work of art because every single line in that device was purposeful. So, and yet the overall, the overall impression is actually quite pleasing to the eye. So, you know, being an Italian, you know, Italians are artists, of, or so they say. But anyway, so I figure, I figure I can get away with it. Uh, so, the here is the first product. They use the 4004. Is the printing calculator called 141 PF, uh, and this uh, was in the market about July 1971. Uh, and at that time. I was done around March with the 4004 because, you know, because it was done, completed, was entered into production, and we started shipping uh, to Bizicom, as Intel started shipping to, to Bizicom around, uh, around uh, uh, June of that year. But I wanted to have that family to be a general purpose device for everybody to use. Basically, the 4004 and the other three members of the family, 4001, 2, and 3, were exclusive to Bizicom. Bizicom was the only customer that could use the devices. And also, uh, Off and Mazur thought that they were only good for calculator-like machines. So I took upon myself to show that you could use the, the family of components to, do, to solve control applications because I felt that they were good controllers and they should be used and, and sold to everybody. So uh, the opportunity came when I was designing a tester to test the 4004. So I used the 4004 to control the tester. I also used the 4004 to generate the pattern, the, the test vectors, to test itself. So you know, with that experience, I was able to convince management to get out from the uh, uh, from the exclusivity agreement of Bizicom and announce the 4004 and the whole uh, family to the world. And this was what happened in 1971 and uh, it was, I felt it was a bold <laughs> announcement, announcing a new era of integrated electronics, but actually it's a rarity because it's, it's true, that's actually what happened. This actually changed the world. So at Intel, when I joined Intel in early uh, uh, 70, 1970, there was another project, there was another custom project that had started even before. Uh, it was what eventually became known as the 8008. That's the world's first 8-bit microprocessor. The engineer that was in charge of this project had more experience in design than I had, but he didn't understand the fundamental basic technology, so he could not really do it. So the project sat there. And I took it over in January of 1971 after I was practically done with the 4004. And the, this engineer worked for me. And we got this product out in the market in, uh, uh, in the, uh, April of 1972. So this was the second project that, uh, that became a general purpose. And it was a better architecture, far better architecture than the 4004. The architecture was developed by CTC, Computer Terminal Corporation, they wanted to use this device for a computer ter an intelligent computer terminal. Notice that this was packaged in an 18-pin package, which was even worse than the, you know, than the case of the 16-pin package for the 4-bit, <laughs> because this was an 8-bit. So we only, I only got two more, two more pins for, you know, for double the number of bits. Uh, but anyway, uh, and uh, uh, so it, it required a number of 
uh, SSI devices around in order to communicate with memories and I.O. devices. And so you've, again, lost a lot of advantage by, by, uh, by the 18 pin package. You may ask, how come 18 pins? You said 16 pins before. Well, because Intel had developed the first, the 1103, which was the first uh, one kilobit RAM, dynamic RAM, with 16 pins. But then they had a problem. They, had they found that they had to back bias the, the, the substrate in order to not to lose memory. Uh, uh, you know, because otherwise, otherwise they, you know, long story. So, so they had to go to 18 pins because they couldn't have a, a 17 pin, to 18 pin. So I jumped at the opportunity to add two more pins to get the because this was originally thought and designed to go to a 16 pin. It would actually not have worked because there was a function that required an extra pin. Anyway, just a, just you know, just a war stories. Uh, in, uh, in the beginning of 1972, uh, actually, uh, in the uh, sorry, in the in the late summer of 1971, before the announcement of the 4004 and before uh, the 8008 was uh, was in the market, I went to Europe in a tour to show to various companies the uh, the coming microprocessors under non-disclosure agreement to a number of customers in Europe. And uh, I got a lot of, you know, a lot of comments, some good, some bad. Uh, and, uh, but I learned a lot. I understood now what, much better, what the customer wanted. And so when I came back from that visit, I came up with the idea of what became the 8080. The 8080, of course, is packaged in a 40-pin package, and my biggest fight was to get my boss to allow me to use 40 pins, and, uh, uh, and also allow me to do it. So we lost nine months against the competition because I had to convince to my, my superiors to, to do the product that actually put Intel in the map as far as microprocessors are concerned, because the 8080 was the first high-performance microprocessor, 8-bit, it became very, you know, immediately highly successful because the ground had been prepared by the 4004 and the 8008. Uh, it had an instruction cycle around, you know, three, four microseconds, which was pretty good, but in, in those days, and uh, and uh, it became, uh, you know, the first personal computers used the 8080 and so on. But for me, I had to fight all the way. With, with everything that I did at the end, I, I almost had to put up a fight. I mean, I, well, I, life is too short. So I decided that I'm better off if I start my own company. And of course, in Silicon Valley, as you know, you're not man enough if you don't start your own company. So I, you know, I, I, couldn't, I couldn't take that insult, so I had to do it. So uh, here I am in front of Zilog. And by the way, this is my third, uh, you know, I, didn't, I forgot to say that in the beginning, I should have said it, sorry guys, but uh, I should have said that I actually, I, on my fourth life, I had already three lives. The first one was the life that I had in, in Italy growing up and uh, you know, educating myself and my first work experiences. My second life is the, where I was uh, essentially an inventor, a, a uh, managing uh, technical groups, and uh, uh, in, you know, in my, my, my career in the process technology and, and microprocessor and, and many other chips that I didn't mention. Uh, but by the time I left Intel, I had 80 people working for me, 60 engineers, and uh, uh, so I had a large group, of about two-thirds of uh, Intel R&D was reporting to me in, uh, at the end of, toward the end of 74. So my, uh, my career took a major turn when I decided to start my own company because now I'm, I'm, I have to learn a bunch of things that I've never done in my life. And uh, so that was a major, a very rapid learning curve for, for, for me. I, I was 32. I started with, a, with a, uh, a, a, a manager that worked for me uh, uh, called Ralph Angerman, and the two of us uh, uh, took office in, in, uh, initially in Los Altos and then in Cupertino. Here I am in front of our first building. And the first product of uh, Zilog was the Z80. The Z80 
was a substantially better product than the 8080. Everything that I learned went into the design of the Z80 uh, uh, CPU, and it was a family of components. See, seamlessly, seamlessly working together. Finally, I could do something where things worked well together as a system, instead of having to always fight to get one piece of the system done. Uh, the Z80 was one microsecond, five volts only, 40-pin uh, package, of course, that was the standard in those days. It became extremely successful. Uh, and as, as uh, Eduardo said earlier, it's still in volume production today. Um, here you see Moore's law in pictures. This is the 4004, and this is the Z80. And uh, this has about 10,000 transistors. This is about 2,200, 2,300 transistors. So you see that in, in the, you know, about five, four years, uh, we, we were able to do something that in those days was not yet understood. I mean, the, the sort of the Morris law became understood later. Um, we also developed the first uh, microcontroller, uh, 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 sorry, the second microcontroller, the Xilog Z8, which also is, a, is in body production today. Uh, the, the, uh, the, it was the best microcontroller in the market as well. And uh, um, it was my first product. That's what I wanted to do first. But then I decided against because uh, I felt that the Z80 was a better, easier product to, uh, you know, in terms of, of, of from, from the business point of view, to get started. And so this became the second one introduced in 1978. Uh, Zylog was a company financed by uh, Exxon. Uh, uh, the 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 uh, big uh, oil company because when I started Zilog in 1974 there was no money from from VCs VCs had disappeared in 1975 the total investment in in of VC in the US was 10 million dollars I mean it, it sounds ridiculous but it's true and so we we couldn't find any money. And, but we found excellent enterprises that had a venture, venture, you know, venture uh, capital arm, and they gave us half a million dollars, and actually built the the Z80, uh, you know, designed the Z80, uh, the development system, all the development software, with four hundred and fifty thousand dollars, and we saved the other fifty so that we could get the next money. <laughs> Um, but anyway, that was, th that was the good news. The bad news is, is that Exxon decided to create a um, group of companies that were going to be uh, a basis for attacking the information field, information technology field. So, so with that decision, we became persona non grata to IBM. That's actually behind the scenes. That's why IBM chose the 8086 instead of the Z8000. It was a much better product because Zylo was financed by Exxon. Big lesson for me. But actually, if I had to go back, I couldn't change the story because there was no money. So either you, you know, either you don't get started, you don't start the company or forget it. So, the, when Exxon made this decision, I decided that I didn't want to be part of, I didn't want to be part of a Exxon empire. I wanted to start another company. And I developed, I started this company called Signa Technologies that uh, developed this uh, <coughs> intelligent telephone for both data, uh, uh, for uh, uh, voice and data, that uh, combined with a personal computer, with a PC, actually would give you a m many of the things that you that you do today with your iPhone: calendar management, uh, communication management, voice and data communications. It was absolutely a, a, a great product. Unfortunately, it was introduced the the same few months before AT and T was broken up by. The uh, you know the Justice Department they basically uh, that completely killed the, the telecommunication business for a, 
about two years. No, nobody would want to buy a telecommunication product. This was a product that had to be adopted within at least a group within a company, so it was not, you know, basically, but people, they were waiting and seeing, and the company failed, essentially. You know, we sold 5,000 of those devices. We should have sold 15,000 to take off. We just, we couldn't. And uh, uh, so the, um, the company didn't make it. But the product was, you know, the people that used it, they, they used it for another 20 years because they were so, it was, they were so good and so effective that until, you know, until uh, internet became a, you know, became a, a, real, a real power, they, 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 were doing, they were doing everything, uh, email and so on. This, this would, uh, you know, it would have email without a central system. So the military, for example, they felt much more secure by sending email directly to each recipient, and this, this device would control all the, uh, all the mail sending automatically, would do it at night, uh, would, would do whatever, you know, at, at whatever time you want it to be sent, and so on and so forth. So it was a, it was a very good product. So finally, we go to Synaptics. Synaptics started after I sold the, uh, uh, the previous company, uh, Signa Technologies, and the idea here was to develop uh, neural networks, artificial neural networks, that could, therefore, learning structures that could, uh, out of which we could make uh, learning systems. Learn systems that instead of being programmed, they learn. These, of course, for pattern recognition applications. Uh, in those days, uh, the backpropagation uh, uh, algorithm was, you know, had been invented a few years before, and there was a resurgence of interest in, in artificial neural network. And so I team up with uh, Carver Mead of Caltech, and uh, uh, he had developed some neuromorphic uh, uh, structures to do, to do sensing uh, of information, you know, mainly vision and, uh, and uh, hearing. And uh, I wanted to develop the, 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 uh, the learning portion using floating gate structures. Uh, and and uh, in those days, the only way to do neural networks effectively would have been to use uh, uh, analog computation, which was okay for the, you know, for the precision that was necessary. And, uh, and so we set out to do, to do this. Uh, we actually developed, in 92, we had the first chip, uh, uh, the, first, the first neural network chip that was uh, reading the, the uh, maker uh, in a uh, characters in a check for high speed check reading. Uh, they had a very a unbelievable precision. It was, it was, it was 99.999% uh, of, of, uh, of uh, you know, uh, recognition rate. And, uh, but basically what happened in synaptics in those early days, there was, uh, uh, there was no way that I could find to create a general purpose device using neural networks that people could use to solve different problems. So each problem would have required a custom device. And that basically would, you know, would prohibit, would, was prohibitive from the development cost. They are, you know, they are analog devices, so they are very diff they are very touchy. They had to be done right. And so, so I, I had to regretfully say, okay, this, this will be in the future, <laughs> but not now. And by the way, 30 years later, still that building block is not available. It will be soon, but not yet. Uh, so I decided to challenge my guys because at that point it was very clear that either I, I, I figure out a product for the company or else I have to close my second company. That's not good. I mean, you know, one is okay, but two, not too good. So I, in those days, people had the uh, notebook computers, you probably remember, with a trackball. You know, trackball was a mechanical mouse upside down. You move the ball and the cursor moves, right? Uh, some of you is old enough to remember that. It was a bad solution because, first of all, it was bulky. Then, you know, the grease in the hands would, you know, lubricate the ball. And so the ball was, would, would slip on the little wheels that were entrained by the, by the ball. And so after three days, the, 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 you know, the cursor would do this on you. And so you had to take the ball off, clean it with alcohol, and, you know, so mess. So I, I took my four, five best engineers and I said, okay guys, we got to figure out how to do a solid state solution to this problem. 
And so we, we were meeting all about uh, once a week, uh, sometimes twice a week, brainstorming, figuring out how to do it. In two months, we were able to have exactly how to do touch, you know, touch, the touch pad and the touch screen that have changed the way we inter interface with our machines. That happened probably 93, 92, 93. So, so that, that was the turn for the company. We decided to go build these this, uh, this devices. And uh, of course, uh, Synaptics was quite successful. It's, it's a $2 billion company, it's a public company uh, today. Uh, that's the touchpad and touch screen. You know, you know what I'm talking about. And finally, th then, uh, then I kicked myself upstairs, as they say which is something that I will talk a little later because that's the right thing to do when you don't enjoy managing anymore. So, uh, and, uh, and then I, in 2003, I ended up uh, leading a company that was started by Carver Mead, uh, but it, it, was, uh, it was in trouble, so I, I came in to rescue it. Basically, the foil on development technology where instead of sensing a color per pixel, which is the conventional technology, is sensed all three colors by having three stacked, uh, three stacked uh, uh, di photodiodes, and in, in using the property that, that silicon travels different distances in uh, the light travels different distances in silicon depending on the wavelength. And so, with this technique, uh, we were able to to make pictures that were substantially, substantially better. Uh, than, than the best uh, in the business. Uh, the company was sold at the end of 2008 to Sigma, and this is one of the, uh, one of the later products that, was, that were done uh, uh, by, by, Sig by uh, Foveon. So, with that, my, uh, my, 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 second, my third life ended, and here is, is a appropriate to reflect a little bit on some of the lessons that, that I learned. Uh, this, this first lesson I learned quite early. Uh, I, I saw a problem once in, a, in the memory of the 4004 where at high temperature, every once in a while it, it, I would lose a bit. And, uh, and I remember that my gut reaction was to pretend that I didn't see it. <laughs> but then I said, well, he was there, you know. So at any rate, to make a long story short, the big lesson is that you got to face, you know, every time they have a problem, face it and deal with it and find the root cause. Because if you don't, it bites you back. And, you know, even if it's something that happens only once or twice, okay, you got to find out what's going on. You know, in, in the in the touchpad, uh, for example, the touchpad that we produce, uh, Synaptics, we have one return every million parts. That's you got to reach this type of level of proficiency. So you 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 you, you know, if you have even a little problem that, that, that you know picks out every once in a while, not good, not good enough. Uh, the same principle is also valid when you perceive something not working in a relationship with, with people that work for you or you work with. So anytime there is a problem, you've got to deal with it. Somebody is not performing, and it, it, you, know, you, you have to tell them you're not performing. If, if, you know, if there is a change to be made, he has to make the change, and if, if, and if not, you part companies. You just cannot let anything fester in a company. And this confrontation is very difficult to do to a lot of people. It was also very difficult to do for me. And it was, uh, it was through this confrontation, particularly this one more than that one, that uh, I learned a lot about myself. You know, wh why, do I, why do I have resistance? Why do I not want to face? What, you know, what am I trying to protect? What do I fear? And on it goes. So the other thing is to be open to receive solution from anywhere. Uh, if you have a problem, uh, you know, don't insist on, the th on your solution or the way you think you're going to solve that problem. Just ask, you know, talk about it, you know, be open, you know. And uh, there is a, you know, let your pride go, in other words. Uh, strike the right balance between freedom and control, that's a, that's a, you know, it's a very general statement, but basically, 
you know, in a company, you, you, people have to be free to make decisions, to do the right thing, and to propose things, and so on. At the same time, you also need, you know, you, you need to have a, a certain discipline, and you know, and wisdom is the, you know, is what allows you to find the right balance. So you have to cultivate that that wisdom, increase that wisdom that allow you to have the right balance. You know, one of the techniques that I use to have people to to stimulate the creativity of people would be to, what I say here, throw up an idea in the air and leave. In other words, I would say, have you ever thought about this? You know, if we were to do that, then, then that would happen. And then I would leave. And then, you know, and then a week later, you know, the engineer would say, you know, you know what I said? I, I thought about it, you know. We could do it this way, or that way. Great, all right, you know, and so, that's how I, I was able to build a climate of innovation within a company by just stimulating people, you know, getting, getting their, their creative juices going. Um, <coughs> of course, you all know that the power is in the team. And, uh, and so the key is how do you foster a team spirit with passion for innovation and for quality products. And, you know, and you, look at, you look at Apple. I mean, Apple is an example uh, of a company where the, the passion of Steve Jobs for innovation and quality products was able to change a company that was about going under into the most valuable company in the, comp uh, in, uh, valuable company in the world. I mean, it's, it's amazing what you can do if you do this. Maybe less, you know, arrogantly than, you know, Steve Jobs did it, but he was successful. Um, always identify the critical issues and pay attention primarily to them. You know, there is a tendency to avoid the critical issues or kind of, you know, not, not face them. Uh, and so, uh, so uh, you know, people end up working on stuff that you already know that it's going to work, so don't worry about that. Worry about this stuff that you don't know how you're going to make it work. So worry on that first and prioritize those. Just, you know, and then, and then you can go to the, you know, and then the rest can follow. This is probably one of the biggest problems for me uh, the first uh, few years of, uh, of running a company because I was, I was trained to solve problems like, a you know, like a, an engineer or a physicist. And, uh, but bis business problems are not technical problems because you don't have enough data. You know, it, it, you know a, problem, if, if a problem in physics or in engineering, you have to have enough data to solve the problem. They are well posed problems. If you if you if I give you an ill posed problem, you say I, I I don't I don't have the initial condition. How do you want me to solve this equation? Or I don't have this other coefficient here. I don't know what it is. And I say you got to solve it anyway because otherwise you got a business, right? What are you going to do? So here you have to develop other ways to f put in data that you don't have, and that's what intuition does for you. For example. I learn to trust my intuition. I learn to cultivate my intuition so that I can trust it more. Where generally in science and technology people say don't trust your intuition, you know, only go logic. Logic is not good if you cannot set, you know, f figure out the assumptions that you have to use in order to logically arrive to a conclusion. So you have to have a balance between the intuitive power and the reasoning power, and that was the hardest was was hard, and, and and you know, and I'm still learning. The other thing is that risk cannot be avoided, and you need something that not everybody has. It's called courage, heart, the ability to say, okay, I don't know. I mean, I got to jump now. I don't know. I may fail. Or I may not fail. Got to jump. If you cannot afford to lose, you cannot do this business because you got to jump. And you don't know if you're going to land on your legs or on your head. Never underestimate the competition. I remember that, you know, that, I mean, we all have pride, right? So you end up that, you, you, you know, you always think that you have a better idea a little bit than the competition, so, you know. Uh, they, 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 but they didn't think about that or, you know. I remember just an example, and I'm not going to talk about myself because I don't want to shame myself, but, but you know, I remember visit, visiting uh, Motorola 
at a time when uh, when uh, 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 I, you know, Apple had just introduced the, the the iPhone, and the Motorola engineer said, "Those guys, they don't understand telephones. You know, I mean, if this telephone drops, it breaks. You know, they they is, they they done everything wrong." Well, three years later, Motorola was no longer in business. Okay. <laughs> so finally, uh, sensing the right product and the right time the right time to market is the most important decision. Those are the wisdom category uh, uh, lessons that you have to learn and you have to cultivate. You know, you put yourself in the position of other people and <clears throat> think about what would I do and then test yourself. Would I go to market and then find out if uh, your competitor went to market, uh, you know, at that time, did they pass or fail? So you train yourself to, to how to modulate, how to modulate your intuition by developing intuitive ways of understanding how, what's going on in the marketplace. Uh, for example, you know, the, many companies started to do fingerprint recognition uh, early, and they had to wait years and years and years in order to, 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 make, to have any business. In fact, most fail. Uh, the, you know, we knew as synaptics how to do fingerprint recognition, but we stay away from it because I, I couldn't see the market developing enough. And then uh, my successor uh, saw the moment when he heard that Apple was going to have a product with fingerprint recognition. So they bought a company to do that had the technology to do to the fingerprints, and within six months they were making you know 10 million units, uh, you know, a, a, you know, a, a, every three months. So, I mean, it's amazing, amazing. If you get something done at the right time, you pay the right price and you get the return on investment, which is quite, quite successful, quite good. So, uh, from a overall management point of view, you know, you need to articulate and explain to every employees the values, the vision, the mission, the strategy, and the objectives of the company. You have to, uh, you know, you have to make the effort not to talk in generalities, but specific. What are our values? What What are we trying to do? How are we going about it? And what are the key objectives that we need to to, to get? Uh, the other thing that is obvious, but uh, you know, some sometimes we forget, is that people watch and copy what you do, not what you say. And so the company's uh, culture and the success is shaped by the action, and sometimes even more by the lack of actions when there should have been an action of the, uh, of the CEO. You, you know, I, I found that teaching people how to make decisions based on principles and values got me uh, a lot of returns because when people would come to me, but you, you, know, I, I, you know, I had this choice and, you know, well, so I said, well, well, what would you do? I mean, you know, and so we said that. Have you thought about this? You know, have you thought about that? And then little by little, the guy understands my process for making decisions. And after a while, they can make the decision themselves. They don't have to come to me. They know, they know how I reason. And so you now have people that are able to carry their own way without having to come to me to solve their problem. So, so that allows you to push the decision making to the lowest possible level in the organization. And also, the, what I anticipated earlier, know when it's time to move on and make a change for yourself. In other words, for me, you know, when I, I found, for example, a synaptics that I didn't, I, you know, I, I didn't enjoy, you know, running a $60 million company anymore. The company was, was fine, everything was fine, but, uh, you know, I, I don't like to run companies that get beyond a certain size, so I hire my replacement and I kick myself upstairs. I became chairman of the board, and the you know I had a, 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 C, a new CEO. I helped them a lot initially, and then the, you know, and then I stay as chairman for another 15 years. But but basically, I was free to do my things, the, the things that I like to do, and that takes takes courage and takes also a sense of you know of, of what are you good at, and what you're not so good at, and generally what you enjoy, you're good at. What you don't enjoy, probably, most likely, is, not, is something that you're not good at. So, 
that took me to about the end of 2008 when uh, my what I call my fourth life uh, started but actually my fourth life started in about uh, 1987 in the early days of synaptics when I was studying neural networks I was reading a bunch of books on, on uh, biology uh, neuroscience and so on and figuring out how the brain works and after a year or so, a year and a half or so of that, I asked myself, but what about consciousness? There was never, the word consciousness in neuroscience books was never mentioned. Like, it, consciousness doesn't even exist as far as a neuroscientist is concerned. It's only circuits that do this and do that, and they're connecting this way and that way, but, you know, consciousness was never a word. And so I started asking myself, could I make a conscious computer? This was 1987-88. And that question began to trouble me at one end, but also began to get my mind going in a direction that I had not thought I would have ever gone because I was a physicalist uh, when I started this process. I thought that, like everybody you know, that studies physics generally, that the world is made of matter and everything, you know, uh, atom, you know, elementary particles, atoms and molecules, uh, you know, playing around in the in space time, and that's, you know, that's all there is to it. So obviously, consciousness, whatever, whatever, whatever exists, it has to be a product of particles banging against each other. I mean, it has to be, right? Because if you start that way, what, what alternative do you have? But then I start asking the the neuroscientists, but what about consciousness? I, I, you know, I feel things. I mean, you know, how do you convert electrical signals into feelings? What, what, what kind of physics is there? I don't worry about it. You know, we'll figure it out. You know, you know, we got still bigger problems to figure out. If you ask anybody in those days, and also in these days, that's what you get. Basically, you know, consciousness is an epiphenomenal or is a, you know, emergent properties of a complex system, as if that explained anything. <laughs> it doesn't explain anything. And, but I'm a guy that wants to figure it out. I want to know how it works. How does it work? That's how I got, you know, I did a bunch of stuff in my life because I want to understand how that something works. So, I decided that I'm going to study the only example of consciousness that I have, which is my own consciousness. <laughs> Since I don't know if you guys are conscious, you know, you know that I, you know, you, 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 each of each one of you knows that is conscious, but you don't know if I'm conscious. I could be, I could be a robot, you know, talking right now, you know, just a sophisticated robot, but you know, unconscious. So, in that exploration, it took a number of years, about 15 years. I discover incredible things about consciousness by through meditation, through a bunch of bunch of things that I did that allow me to experience states of consciousness that you would consider impossible. For example, you know, you experience your yourself as the world. So you are the world, but you're also the observer of the world. So how is that possible? It's like quantum mechanics all over again, you know? You, have, you are both a particle and a wave, you know, that, that kind of stuff, you know, that kind of mind-bending stuff. So, I could never figure out how you can give feelings to a computer. And so, I realized that probably we might have to start by considering consciousness a fundamental property of this stuff of which everything is made. If you take Cartesian dualism, you know, you have res cogitans and res extensa, right? And, uh, of course, you know, when people found that the, the, you know, the stuff of the brain is the same stuff that, you know, uh, objects are made of, you know, people, are, you know, say, okay, res cogitans, they can throw it away. It's all res extensa, and so we'll keep on going that way. I'm saying, I'm not so sure about that. What if we start with the energy of which space time and matter 
are made, is also self-illuminating, is energy that can somehow know itself. What about if we start that way? Where can we go? Can we explain the fact that we have an inner world inhabited of feelings, and there is an outer world inhabited of objects? And so that, that's about 10 years ago. And of course, uh, you know, I'm not the only one thinking this way. In fact, uh, many of the spiritual traditions uh, started that way, considering the, you know, the, the stuff of which everything is made as being res cogitans in different words. Uh, so I decided to study explore that direction. And I found that there are a number of people, a number of physicists and a number of cognitive scientists, not many, but a number that are very good, that also lean in that, in that direction. But they cannot explore that possibility because nobody gives them any money, because everybody knows that consciousness is a phenomenon of atoms and molecules. So what are you, do what are you talking about? So I started a foundation. Why? because I, I want to allow the people that, that think differently to try out and see if that different approach yields result. And so the foundation is giving money to different research groups in the US. Uh, I can only do duty in, in the US because it's a US foundation. Uh, I also started a chair in the physics of information because I like the, you know, I think that life Living systems hold the key to the type of complexity and the type of structure that can, in a sense, hold a level of consciousness that is much, much higher than purely symbolic systems like computers. And the reason is that living systems that are considered by most, uh, uh, by most uh, uh, biologists as essentially classical systems biochemical systems. As far as I'm concerned, they are quantum systems. They are open systems. Uh, you know, clearly very far from equilibrium. The type of information that they are processing, because they are processing systems as opposed to purely biological system or bio, you know, um, uh, how do you say, uh, you know, uh, biochemical systems. The biochemistry is just the hardware, but the the, the, the information process that goes on in a living cells and in, in a multicellular organism are immensely more complicated than what goes on in a computer. And I'm convinced that they use superpositional states, not entanglement, but superpositional states to, the, to their advantage. So I want to understand the nature of information and the physics of information of systems that are not the kind of systems that channel information studies. Channel information is basically equilibrium thermodynamics, essentially. So we need to go and go way beyond that. And so that's the reason for that, for that chair, for that, uh, you know, that I started. But in, with other cognitive scientists, we study models where if you start by assuming that at the foundational reality there are uh, conscious entities that exist not in this space-time, but exist in some other cognitive space or semantic space, then this physical reality may simply be the, the space of symbols that these cognitive entities use to communicate with each other. So all of a sudden, we have an interaction between a semantic space and a syntactic space, which is made of the matter which is what matter appears to us, that's how we imagine it in our mind, but in reality they are symbols that are used for cognitive agents to communicate with each other. So the, starting this way, the model, then you got to explain, of course, how physics emerges from this type of beginning. And uh, it, it, I can tell you already that it is much easier to explain how outer reality emerges if you from inner reality to start this way, then phys physics can explain how consciousness can arise out of purely outer symbolic structures. In fact, they, they have no idea how, how, how it can possibly occur. 
In other words, if, if you don't have the, the seeds of consciousness from the beginning, how the hell are they going to come out of something that, that, that cannot be conscious at all? Consciousness has to be a fundamental property of nature, in other words. That's where I'm at. With that, I think we should have uh, at least five, ten minutes of questions. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Federico, for this insightful and inspiring talk. I'd like to spend uh, time for uh, questions. So we have one microphone. Maybe somebody can uh, bring in questions from the audience. Uh, could you comment about CAD and design tools? Yeah. Because uh, nothing was existing and now it's killing creativity. <laughs> um, I'm not sure that it's killing creativity, but certainly, certainly everything that I did was done by hand with a ruler and pencil. Okay. And in fact, uh, the, the first, the 4004, you know, the, that, those families of devices, we are done using rubylith. I don't know if probably few of you know what rubylith is. Basically, it's a mylar sheet with a little skin that you that you can peel off. A, a red, you know, a dark red skin. So you 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 put that in a cutting table and you cut lines and you peel off, and then you take a picture of this huge because it's a 500x, 400x. Take a picture and then reduce it by a factor, of, you know, to, to by a factor of ten, and then from there you make the working plates, the you know, the tool that you use for for the devices, and uh, you know, so so uh, that process was so error prone that even transporting the 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 rubylith, some something would peel off by itself, you know, by rubbing it or whatever, and then you had spent one month checking this artwork. And then you know something doesn't work, and then you find that a little piece of red thing fell off, right? So, uh, so the 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 it was the amount of work necessary to overcome the uh, you know the, the limitation of the technology was enormous, uh, and uh, uh, even the Z80, I actually drew the Z80 myself about two thirds of it. With my hands, that's that, you know I have glasses because I lost my eyesight by spending five months drawing that chip by hand. And by the way, that chip is so good in terms of compactness and you know it's unbelievable. If you if you look at it, you know there isn't a, you know there isn't much much more than a little bit of open space anywhere. So yes creativity but <laughs> but now now you can do things much easier so the creativity is not in the at that level it is in the higher level what is the biggest thing you deplore having done or not done that would have made you happier or more successful um, you know I, I I think that we learn much more by mistakes than any other way. Success, in fact, can get to your head. And so, so you really learn when you have to suffer a little bit by having done something that proved to be wrong when you thought it was right. So I believe that my life, I'm here to learn. I'm not here, you know, I'm here to learn. And so, so the pleasure is in learning, and so you got to allow yourself to make mistakes. And, and, and to say, oh, now, now that I know I would never have done that, actually would deprive you of a learning. And in fact, you couldn't even do it. You know, it's, it's only, you know, uh, you know it's, 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 it's not good thinking because you couldn't, you couldn't go back with the same mind that you had after you learned. The, you know, basically, learning means that you change, you shift the pattern in your mind, okay? And that pattern that shifted allows you to then go back and do the, and do that thing would have allowed you to do that thing differently. Not having that pattern, how can how can you even ask the question in some way, right? So, when, yeah. when you ask the question, what is consciousness? The, the first tentative answer that, that pops to my mind is maybe it's a sort of simulation. Um, what do you? Well, hold on. so consciousness. Let me let me give you an example. I mean, let, let me explain. Uh, you know better what I mean. 
so suppose suppose you're smelling a rose, right? You smell a rose. I said, what, what's going on? Well, you have molecules that hit the you know the uh, nasal epithelium. You have you know sensory molecules there that uh, that uh, you know look for shapes and they send electrical signals to the you know to the to the uh, uh, to the cortex to process the, the signals and so on and you end up recognizing a pattern okay that pattern that you recognize is still a symbol as far, for example if I make a computer right that does that I, I can make a computer a kind of an artificial nose it would do the similar things okay at the end it would take a class of signals and through pattern recognition, recognize that as rose. And you could even say the word rose, mm -hmm. but you have taken a symbol and you have converted it into another symbol. The symbol is the pattern of electrical signals in a beginning, you know, in the entry of the neural networks, and the uh, symbol rose at the end. There is nothing in between. What do we have in between? We take that pattern of electrical signals also that are being recognized as rose, and now we feel the perfume of the rose. That's a feeling. That's a quale. That is not electrical signals. It's not a pattern in memory. And that quale brings all the memories by association that are associated with smelling the rose and blah, 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 and, and what we think about rose and what we feel about rose and so on. So, Feeling is the key to con consciousness. Consciousness is the stuff that takes electrical signals somehow and transforms them into feelings. If I feel love for a person, that feeling is not a word, it's a feeling. And of course, you know, scientists are, you know, they have their feeling beaten out of them at school because, you know, that's stuff that you're not supposed to have, right? Everybody tells you that that's bad stuff. You got to be illogical, coherent, go down, blah, 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 blah. but that's not the way it works. We are feeling beings, and we know because we feel so. Even when you are done with a theorem, proving a theorem, you have got it. Oh, that's a feeling. Comprehension is a feeling. Is a ha ha. Comprehension is actually getting the meaning out of a feeling. So you need a feeling first that carries the meaning, then you get the meaning out of a feeling. That's another property of consciousness, which is not in machines. We comprehend. We understand, comprehend, because we feel. Otherwise, you will have another symbol that from rose you go to another symbol. So we, we go symbol to qualia, Qualia to meaning, meaning to symbol, meaning to qualia. So we we try, we, we, we we make how to say we, we move from uh, from from plane to plane of you know of sy sy syntactic and semantic without recognizing that we have made those translations. A computer can only go from symbol to symbol. It cannot be conscious. There is nothing that can transform a electrical signals into a feeling and nothing that can get the meaning out of that feeling. And it's, it, you know, this is the beginning, right? So you got to think about it because we have, we have the wrong idea about con what consciousness is. We have been taught badly about consciousness. So there are many, many, many more questions. I'd like to uh, maybe give space to one more. Who was the first? <laughs> yeah. Uh, maybe, yeah, in the, right in the center, yeah. Me? Yeah, yeah. go ahead. Uh, okay. Thank you for the talk. Uh, I'm from the generation whose feelings were like, kicked away in school, so yeah. Uh, I we are, we are all in the same yes. generation. Uh, so I, I like the thing you said about your foundation that you want to check if those uh, people with alternative uh, thoughts yeah. uh, can develop something which uh, will uh, have a yield. So suppose there will be no yield. Mm -hmm. Suppose there will be no theory which can actually uh, predict things. Because yeah. well, we can describe the world with any ways, with the god, with the solipsism and stuff. But to predict uh, things is like a completely different matter. So will you be satisfied with that, or you will be keep looking and looking and looking until like 
Well, it, so, so do you have a certain threshold where you stop or what? Well, I mean, you know, obviously, um, we, you know, we have to, you know, I, I'm trying to do science and not philosophy, right? I mean, if, you know, if it was philo philosophy, only philosophy, I would, you know, philosophy probably. Is science, religion. What? <laughs> Philosophy is still a science, religion. No, philosophy is not science, really. <laughs> <laughs> I, unless you study philosophy. I mean, <laughs> no, I mean, I'm, I'm kidding, but yeah, no, it's fine. But uh, you know, basically, you know, philosophy. See, science, you you had to be you you had to be you had to use mathematics as a language, really. I mean, it goes back to actually it goes back to Pythagoras, right? Galileo repeated what Pythagoras said. Uh, Basically, you need language to express as rigorous concepts as you can, and the ambiguity is really at the level of assumptions. But when, when you have taken those assumptions, you go with a formal, a, a mathematical formalism to the consequences. <coughs> that step is essential to any science. So, philosophers stop at the words, and words are ambiguous. You can play with words, uh, you know, any whichever way you want, and so that's why they can never agree on anything. Because, because you know, I, I I mean that with that word, and you mean something else, and so we, we can never get it beyond generalities. So I want a science here, and so what I want is a mod, a mathematical model, out of which come general relativity and quantum physics as special cases of a larger construction that starts with cognitive principles instead of materialistic principles. And the way I look at things, and of course, you know, I'm completely wrong, but the way I look at things, the reason why physics had such a hard time to combine to, you know, general relativity with, with, uh, with uh, quantum physics, I mean, they have tried for 80 years, they haven't succeeded. And in fact, uh, the, you know, is, we are further away today than we thought we were 30, 40 years ago is because the nature of the observer is fundamental in both quantum physics and general relativity and special relativity. So, and those are fundamental aspects of, a, of cognition that in, you know, kind of infiltrate physics that so far has been using only symbolic, symbolic forms of interactions of, of matter. This note, yep. greatly saved, uh, <laughs> Federico. I'd like to thank you one more time. <laughs>